Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Welcome back, everybody. Thank you so much. We have a great conversation today, but first I want to point out that my guests are so knowledgeable and so giving in sharing that today's guest, Nicole Will, is back again to talk about the topic we had originally planned. I got confused and went off on a caring for the caregiver topic, and she rolled with it so well that I didn't even realize we (laughs) technically recorded the wrong topic until we were all done. So she's back to give us even more advice on the dynamic between families and senior living communities and their employees. So welcome back, Nicole. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, It's always fun to visit with you. Hello, hello. Thanks for joining me today. Now that it's starting to get warmer, I am excited to talk to Kari Loyal. He went on a cross-continent bike ride with his dad, which most of you are probably now saying, oh, geez, why would you ever do that? But his dad also was in the early stages of Alzheimer's, so we had a double, double challenge. So we're going to hear all about that. But first, thanks for joining us, Kari. Thanks, Jennifer. Glad I'm uh, glad to be here. So why don't you introduce yourself to the listeners, tell, tell them about you and how you came to write the book that you wrote and which was based on your trip across the country with your dad and all the good stuff. Sure. Uh, so I'm originally from Oregon, uh, grew up there, um, was a very progressive in Eugene, very progressive place with a lot of athleticism. And so uh, in the 70s, uh, my dad uh, was commuting to work by bike. He was mm-hmm. so kind of pioneering in that sense. And then um, as part of uh, uh, by the early 80s, 81, 82, 83, 84, um, there was this strange event called triathlons um, <laughs> uh, that no one had heard of except some crazy folks in Kona. Uh, but I ended up participating with that and my uh, uh, with my dad and um, um, and Eugene also was track town. And so night that's where Nike was started. So very uh, kind of pioneering, bold, adventurous uh, athleticism. And so uh, kind of the, the long story, uh, the, the, the short is started off with this um, uh, uh, doing outdoor things with my father. Um, and uh, and um, uh, and uh, we had an, our first kind of taste of a bike adventure was when we did a three day, 300 mile journey through Wyoming. Um, I was in eighth grade at the time, and that was a little taste of adventure. And uh, uh, and and lit the fire to do a lot more of that. Um, a number of years later, um, I did a two week bike trip down the California coast with a roommate, a college roommate, and that opened my eyes to kind of tour cycling and the fascinating people you meet along the way. Um, and my dad had always been talking about doing a cross country bike trip, and there was something that in 1976 there was something called the Trans America. Uh, a bike route that was established and a group of a crazy group of like four or 5,000 folks, uh, all ages, uh, all 50 states represented 14 countries, then pedaled from Astoria, Oregon, back east to Yorktown, Virginia. And I would later discover actually on the ride that that planted a seed in my dad's head because they had come within a half mile of our house. They passed through oh, wow. Eugene, Oregon. And so when he would always talk about doing a bike cross country bike trip, that's that's where the seed got planted. We talked about that for a number of years. Fast forward, uh, came real close in two thousand one. We did a Colorado adventure, uh, biking for a week. I got maps for a cross country, but it didn't happen. Uh, and and then in twenty thirteen, uh, my dad. It was twenty twelve, twenty thirteen. My dad got a diagnosis of mild cognitive impairment. Um, which many of your listeners will now be very, very well versed in. And, uh, and, and at that point, we started to see a number of symptoms um, and growing concern among friends and family. Um, and uh, again, we can go into this in much detail, but 2015 then comes around. Um, I'm in New York City um, uh, and uh, I just accepted a job that was going to be down in the Caribbean. And 
I recognized that I had this four month block where um, I potentially could exit what I was doing in New York and uh, and have this space where my dad and I could do what we were had been talking about for 30 years. And I realized, OK, lots of red flags. People, everyone's saying we got it. Merv, no, he can't do this. He can't. My dad's name is Merv. He can't do this. No, we're all concerned. And I said, well, wait a minute let's let's i i recognize that this might be our last opportunity to do pursue this dream that we'd had um and uh and and we ended up and i again i can go into detail on all this but but we ended up making the decision to pull the trigger and um pretty last minute said all right we need to make this 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 happen and in the span of just a few weeks suddenly we were with gear heading back to virginia um, dipping our wheel in uh, Yorktown, Virginia, the river there, and the, the which connects to the ocean, and then we began a seventy-three day journey um, across the country, forty-six hundred miles. My dad was seventy-five years old at the time, and so th th there were going to be clearly challenges that anyone faces when you're doing a bike adventure. Then there were going to be some challenges of doing it with a seventy-five-year-old. And then there were going to be these additional unknown challenges of what happens when you do that with someone with early stage Alzheimer's. And I realized there were kind of two things. Number one is um, we'd get to take this on, this dream that we'd share. But then secondly, it would be a chance for me to see how my dad was doing up close because rarely would we be more than 10 feet apart. Um, and uh, I would only see him you know trips to Oregon, you know, for a week, something like that. And, but for 73 days straight, I could see how he was doing with Alzheimer's and then we could make decisions going forward based on that. So that ended up that, that, and, and, and the book that I wrote uh, four years later, um, right after he passed was conversations across America. And the subtitle is a father and son Alzheimer's and 300 conversations along the trans America bike route that capture the soul of America. And that's because along the way, not only was there our story and the bike story and the Alzheimer's story, um, I took the time to transcribe all the short conversations that we had with people um, uh, who came up to us along the way from coal miners in Kentucky to farmers in Kansas to um, entrepreneurs, uh, to folks walking across the country to other people uh, battling serious illnesses and injuries. So now we, we got a lot of directions we can go from there. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. So my first question, the Transamerica Trail, doesn't that follow like the railroad line? Or am I thinking yeah, of something it, else? It, uh, it, it does not. Um, it, right. Again, it was set up in 1976, and it ended up becoming an outfit called Adventure Cycling Association, which is based in um, uh, uh, it's Missoula, Montana. And so they pr have produced maps. And it's mostly... Uh, back roads, so country roads. There was one stretch in Wyoming where we're on a Interstate 80, or which was awful for about seven miles. But most of it is on smaller country roads, and so you're really getting to know uh, rural America really well because most of the towns along the way um, are towns of a thousand or less, five thousand or less, ten thousand or less. You wouldn't want to ride Interstate 80 here in Northern California. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm always surprised yeah, the people that, that do it on motorcycles, but I would not take my road bike anywhere near that freeway. <laughs> yeah, that 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 stretch into a um the the toughest headwind we had just outside of Rollins. Uh yeah, that was that was um uh a little more exciting than I would have liked. <laughs> so you made this decision almost last minute, so you guys didn't train or you know, do short trip. You didn't do anything yeah. really to prepare. Yeah. Uh, yes and no. So, so one of the, I've always been very athletic and so I always have a, a base fitness that I, uh, that is, um, uh, that I knew that, um, you know, I'd be okay. Uh, my dad was in very good shape. Uh, but it's one thing to be in shape, you know, for a 75 year old, it's another thing to be now biking 4,600 miles and carrying weight. So one of the first things that I did was I made sure just to make sure that I wasn't crazy. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, I, I had a little test, you know, we, we had really this three week period where it was like, okay, w if we're going to do this, we have to make decisions in three weeks. And one of those things was, can we actually pull this off from a fitness standpoint? And so 
just about a, uh, a week before we left, um, I had my dad uh, loaded up his bike um, and put uh, not full weight, but uh, a, a little bit of weight on it. Uh, um, and then we went off and we rode in the dark mm. and it was raining. Oh, yeah. And, and there was um, there were some steep hills. And we did 15 miles and he got through that and he was smiling afterwards and he enjoyed that. And I said, uh, Hey dad, all you need to do is do that four times, about four times every day. And we can go as slow as we need. We can take breaks between, um, and we will get stronger as we go. And that's exactly how it played out, which, um, was, a, it was a very challenging first few weeks while we were getting stronger. Um, um, but then, uh, after those first three or four weeks, um, uh, then, uh, yeah, we had, we had built up the capacity, uh, to pedal long and hard. That's just unbelievable. I'm in really good shape. I, I also road cycle. Um, mostly I don't really like hills, not that I can't do them, but I, I just get out of breath so fast. <laughs> it's frustrating. I, I, I really should talk to either a trainer or a doctor. Like, why is my um, oxygen conversion, like, why is that so bad? Yeah. It's very interesting. Um, but how, approximately how much weight are you adding? So, like, were you guys on, like, regular road bikes or more like? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so um, we ended up, uh, we, we bought right before the trip. We said, okay, let's, let's get what, what's kind of. A, a, a well-regarded bike and we got a, a bit was kind of a standard classic a trek 520 which is considered a touring bike and this is actually just before they started having all the gravel um the kind of the concept of gravel bikes that are sort of hybrids and um but we got the the kind of the mainstay touring bike and so it's a heavy a little heavier bike but very durable um and then you get the panniers so you get panniers on the back i ended up uh, we knew that i would need to carry more weight so i had a rear left pannier, rear right pannier, stuff on top, and a front left pannier, a front right pannier, and then a front saddlebag. And my dad had um, just two rear panniers. And then he also, he was uh, very um, obstinate about taking a backpack. <laughs> and uh, it's like, Dad, you don't need a backpack. That's the whole point of this. <laughs> but I had to pick and choose battles, um, you know, which which was kind of you know one of those early when uh, kind of a funny story when we were packing for this. This is literally the night before we're flying off because again, this things were moving pretty quickly, and we laid laid out everything on the floor, and you know, um, so all of the gear, all the clothing we we're going to take, and and my dad had you know, seven pairs of cotton underwear. Well, anyone <laughs> that knows, like. You know, you, you, when you're cycling, you, there's also gear has come a long ways. And so you get synthetic things, you got light for all this, but you're not wearing cotton underwear. No. Um, and there was, and, and, and then there was, um, uh, you know, he really wanted to stick with his ponchos. Um, so <laughs> it rained, we kept on, it's like, those are great for Oregon football games in the rain that we used many times when you're sitting in bleachers, not so, not so good. And, uh, you know, it, yeah, I guess you can get it to work. Uh, but, uh, but not ideal because you get, you know, you get, the, there's a better gear. And then, uh, and then he was adamant about the backpack. And so I had to, I realized, okay, you know, so I have to, we're going to have some situations where we might disagree. Okay. How much of that is, you know what? I've actually just got more experience now than he does on this subject. And so I need to be patient and I need to teach him. Um, or, Hmm. How much of this is Alzheimer's and he's just not processing something and it's just not sinking in. And so once again, guess what? I need to be patient. Um, or no, he gets it and he's just, he's just obstinate and he doesn't want to change. And so in which case we can battle it out and see, see who, see who wins. But we did go, so we did go back with, we got rid of the underwear. We did go back with ponchos, which we wore on the first day and, uh, and we, and we, uh, and he took his backpack. Uh, and, uh, and about three States in, in Illinois, when he accidentally, we, we, he, his backpack had disappeared. He'd left it somewhere. And I quickly did, you know, the inventory. Okay. We're missing this, this, this that we can replace it. That, 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 that. And I was like, ah, okay, shoot. And thinking that God was basically helping us out. You know, it's like, okay, good. Yeah. We can move on without the backpack now. That's funny. So for people who don't road bike, the reason a poncho is not helpful is because not only is water coming from above, it's splashing up 
from your tires. And so the poncho is not going to protect the underneath where the water is coming up. So. Yeah. And, so the, and you get just, you get flapping of, I mean, the yeah. wind now, now you got this flapping Superman at 360 degree Cape going around. So it's uh yeah, it's, it, it, but, but we did it. And I was like, okay, well, I got to pick and choose my battles here. And, uh, and that one's not too bad. The visual of the pot with a yellow. Yeah, one was. I think uh, uh, one one of us was yellow. One was red. I think so. Yeah. So on a on a positive, right? The high visibility, which our our top priority in all of this was safety. I mean, like we we, we, we want to get across, but we've got it. it. We everything is about safety. Doing it safely. Yeah, <laughs> they didn't miss you with those flapping ponchos. That's hysterical. <laughs> oh, so. In 2013, the I have a Trek um, endurance road bike, which the front nice. fork is carbon. Yeah, you couldn't afford a full carbon. But it was in 2013. Was that the pre-carbon fiber days? No, there. Uh, I think there was carbon. That, that was right around then. Um, yeah, the the Trek. I, I can't. I, I'm trying to remember if ours is. I think is it might even be steel. Um, I, I, I can't. Remember. So what did but, those bikes uh, weigh? What were you, what were you uh, well, peddling? So, so it's interesting. So, so we, um, when you get to the adventure cycling association, um, yeah, they weigh about 30 pounds and they're, they're around, th- I think it was around 30 pounds, um, you know, compared to a 15 pound racing bike these days. Um, yeah, my bike that's, is 20. That, yep. Yeah, that that's, 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 so that's pre gear. And we actually weighed our bikes, um, when we got to, um uh, missoula and we had done some more shifting of weight more to me less to him um his was i think it was around 20 20 pounds um and mine was 100 <gasps> so, yeah so to lug uh, to to lug uh you know as you said talked about hills you know flat flat is one thing and then as soon as you have uh hills with weight that's where you uh you need to be Walk. ready for it. yeah <laughs> Yeah, and so that was one. That, and and so our our early, uh, you know, many folks who've done the cross country, they know that oftentimes the toughest spots they'll say are um, uh, Virginia and Kentucky, because the hills there. Whereas you know the the the, the Rockies and all of that, there's there uh, you go very high in elevation, but they're typically four percent, six percent grades, and 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 you get much you get steeper grades. They're shorter, but they're often steeper in kentucky and virginia and so they surprise a lot of folks and there's a lot of them um and so there were early on there were a number i mean there's one day where uh uh merv was walking his bike for probably four times mm. and um and it's like all right let's get off the bike and pushing it and uh and then there was one there were the last day that we had was in idaho there was one day in idaho on a really steep section but uh, all the in between he had he, he was fine that's that's cool. I have to do I have to do this ride uh, more time on the Peloton, I guess, and get out there. I live in a um, so I live an hour south of Lake Tahoe. Yeah, it's all hilly. Yeah, gorgeous yeah. area. Yeah, it's beautiful, but it basically I swear it's uphill everywhere. <laughs> yeah, it, it's the the ups exceed the downs, which I'm not even sure how that's physically possible, <laughs> but yeah, it's it is. Um, and there's. I know I need to venture out some more, but that'll happen this spring when it's warmer yeah. and not raining like uh, California and it's rain right now. It's getting, getting yeah. on my nerves, but, um, well, the, I did, mean, the key with the key with all of that though, is just, is, is building up. Right. And so whatever right. you're at, again, you, you take that, take that 15 mile increment, start with 15. Then can you get to where you do two times 15 and 15? Then can you do three times 15, 15, 15, you know, with breaks in between. And so whatever that is, if, even if they're hills, can you get to X marker? Can you go a little beyond X marker? Can you go beyond that? And and you build up over time. This is true. The furthest I've done is a metric century for those people listening that aren't cyclists. That's basically 65 miles-ish. Fantastic, yeah. Yeah, we've done it several times. The last time we did it was like four and a half hours. I was like, that's pretty good, you know, considering we're just very casual so did you pack a lot of food or did you eat on the road? Because food's heavy. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, yeah. It, it was a great question. Um, we we ended up, um, we always had something because we, ne- you know, part of, part of this was we didn't know where we were going to end up. And <laughs> so th- there, there, there was a reality of the way we were doing this, which is, again, a little bit on the fly, 
you know, three weeks, really three weeks prep. Um, you know, I had my Excel sheet out that's like, oh, day one, day two, day three, day four, all the way through. And okay. But you just, you couldn't commit to that. And you couldn't commit because you didn't know how our fitness was going to be every day. You didn't know how um, weather was going to be every day. And then you didn't know, again, with this variable of Alzheimer's, how was that going to impact things? And so, um, and so, you know, I think a, a telling stat is that 75% of the days that we went across the United States um, of those 73 days, 75% um, uh, of the days, we did not know at 4 p.m. where we were going to sleep that night. And so it's okay. All right, we'll figure it out. Let, yep, we can go a little further. Okay, now where are we going to stay in that town or where? And, and um, um, yeah, so, so 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 then with food, we always wanted to make sure we had food on us. But um, but we were yeah often stopping in every town, whether that's for um, a meal um, uh, or at a restaurant or or to go in a grocery um, store. And, you know, one of the, an, an additional complication was that my dad um, uh, was celiac. And so he ate gluten free. Oh boy. And, <laughs> and it, it was one thing, you know, it, it, so in, in 2002, when we discovered that he came back to New York City in 2002, um, we looked up gluten free and we found three places in New York City that said, hey, we have gluten free uh, products here. And that was oh, a Lord. big deal because no one in this country, very few folks knew what that meant to be gluten free. Um, fast forward to 2015 and suddenly, wow, it's it's not the only folks with celiac. It's kind of a cool thing. And where well, you go here. And but that's mostly in urban areas. When mm -hmm. you go into those small towns of a thousand, five thousand, ten thousand in 2015, it's like glue to what, what, what? And, and, and so we discovered there are far more limited options um, uh, when we were eating. And, uh, and so Walmart of all places became a, uh, when we finally came across a Walmart, I was like, whoa, they've got four shelves of gluten-free stuff. And so we would stock <laughs> up on that <laughs> and, and load up our bags with, you know, anything that was gluten-free, gluten-free, put it in there. Oh, great. Now rice is gluten-free, correct? Yes. Okay. I was, I just wanted to make sure. Because I always marvel, and this is kind of like a random, interesting fact, is that the tour buses for the Tour de France teams frequently have onboard washers and dryers. Huh. Yuck. I'm sure those clothes stink to high heaven <laughs> at the end yeah. of those days. Um, but they also your car make... doesn't have that. It, 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 your vehicle doesn't have that in on as no, well. and it's a hybrid. You think it'd be cool like oh. that? <laughs> But they also, some of them have like commercial rice cookers. So, you know, you hear about um, athletes carb loading. Well, a lot of the Tour de France riders, they eat rice, white rice, but they eat a craptastic amount of rice. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. I don't, I mean, obviously you're not lugging along a, a rice cooker with you, but I just yeah. thought that was an interesting, interesting fact based on your dad's extra, oh, geez. You just really wanted the challenges, huh? Yeah, you know, and 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 you know, on that note, you just to tie this back into the Alzheimer's. Um, one of the difficulties, because one of those one of those early symptoms was, um, uh, you know, forgetting words and names, and so by that stage, it, it was difficult for my dad to string three or four sentences together without mm. some stumbling, stuttering, and so now you're talking about trying to explain celiac disease or gluten-free um, to someone in a small town that has never heard of it before, but you're doing it with faltering speech. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, e e even, even more difficult. Yeah. I'm sure some of these people must have thought you guys had gotten beamed down from some planet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, because it's an established route, you know, there's, there are, um, you know, each year, I don't, I don't know what, I think it's a couple thousand do it each year something hmm. like that. So, um, uh, so, you know, there are, um, there are plenty of places along there where, um, they regularly see and host cyclists. Oh, hosting. So you got to, did you ever stay with any families or camp in their yards? Yeah. Yeah. So, so, you know, we did, we did everything from, um, uh, on, on 
two occasions. One was the celebration at the end, and then one was in Yellowstone when there was no other option and it was going to be cold. And we had decided by then that we couldn't camp because that created a, a series of problems for my dad. Um, there were two times where we'd taken well, luxury hotels that blew our budget. Then <laughs> there were um, a number of uh, kind of just low tier motels. Um, uh, then there were um, a number of churches, uh, places of faith opened their doors. Um, then there was a, an outfit called Warm Showers that people sign up to to host specifically cyclists. So we stayed in some folks' homes. Um, then we had some campgrounds and some RV parks. Then we had at the very low end, just pitching a tent on the side of the road um, <laughs> or behind a gas station or behind a fire. Uh, um, and then we also had um, a handful of folks spontaneously that we just met along the route uh, say, you know what, why don't you stay with us tonight? And I'd, open their- I'd be one of those people. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was just, it, and, that, and that's magical. Um, uh, that was magical. And just, a, again, a reminder of, you know, when you, you know, most of the people in this country, almost all are really good people that want to do well for others. I believe it. Now with all of this moving about and never knowing where you're going to end up, I mean, that's a little hard for those of us that don't have cognitive challenges. And most of us like to know where we're going to sleep, where we're going to eat, especially when you've been riding all day and you're starving. Um, you know, that it's a surprising calorie burn for those of you who don't do it. Um, but how did dad handle just the day-to-day -day uncertainty on top of early stage Alzheimer's? It sounds like that yeah. could have been a recipe for disaster. Yeah. You know, I mean, so, so one of from day one i had to say okay cuz i just i had not spent that much time seeing everything i knew again these general symptoms you know they they i'd seen him confused with place and time i'd seen him uh stumbling for words i'd seen him you know repeating certain things and um and then you know one of those other things was uh, we we there was just this you would see see this growing collection of post-its and to-dos and things around the house that just expanded and expanded and expanded with nothing actually ever getting done um and so i was aware like okay i'm going to see now firsthand what are some of these things and um and so when we started out the the you know merv was merv was fine with as long as he had a good sherpa someone that could guide him he loved being on a bike and so he was, as long as he could be guided, um, uh, that was fine. And, um, and, uh, but, but on the, you know, on the, our fourth day, well, actually the, 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 first, the first day, the first day was, um, two thirds of the way through the day. We're on this long stretch of highway. I can see long, far, uh, a long way ahead, long way back, no cars behind us. And I have to go to the bathroom. And so I just say, Oh dad, Hey, let's pull over here. I'm gonna go to the bathroom, pull over. And now I have. I realized I don't even need to get off my bike. I can just lower my Lycra, water the brush there. And, and you know, 10 seconds later or 15 seconds later, like, hey, I'm good. I back up and, and I'm good to go. And I turn around um, and I don't see my dad. Uh oh And I'm like, and I'm like, dad, dad. And, and I, and then I look and I see his bike is a little off the road and um in kind of in this and then there's trees and other things maybe 20 meters off and i don't see him at all and i yell out dad 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 and i'm sitting here thinking really i'm the sherpa and i've lost him on day one like <laughs> oh my god what a what an awful son negligent son and uh and i just as i'm starting to almost panic um yeah, that 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 poncho the yellow poncho <laughs> comes out from behind some trees and uh, and he's got his he's actually bleeding in his legs because oh, he's no. gone into some he's gone in some thorn bushes and so we get him all cleaned up and and um, and then I realize that okay that that I don't I don't don't think it's the Alzheimer's but I think it's a little more modesty that he just wanted to get to the bathroom but but that was my first fear was okay I've got to keep an eye on him because am I going to lose him um, and that's very you know that's a very real thing um, when you um, you know talk with a number of folks and. Uh, and then on day four, we got into, we get into camp and I say, okay, you know, he's going to go, he's going to go to the bathroom. And I said, all right, let me, I'm going to get it's kind of settled in. And I set up our, I, I go to a store, get some dinner, set, I set up our camp. I set up the tent. I make dinner. I eat dinner. 
And about 45 or 50 minutes later, he comes back and I'm scratching my head saying, okay, I, I think I now need to go with it to see why it's taking him 45 or 50 minutes, you know, in the bathroom there just to you know, set something. And, uh, and then the next morning, day five, he comes out of the bathroom ready to ride. And he's got his uh, black lycra shorts on with this, uh, with this red uh, padded crotch on inside out. And so you just got this giant red and I said, okay, we've got some fashion uh, miscues here that, that we, we can correct that. Dad, let's go back in. Um, uh, but there were, you know, a number of things like that uh, um, that we just, just needed to be aware of and, and make our adjustments and go. But, but of um, as, as long as you could point, we could point him, uh, you know, he was fine. And, and I could ask him though, on any day to your point, where do we start today? Uh, and where did we end? And he wouldn't be able to tell you. Um, but it really didn't matter because with a good guide, he was, he was open and, um, and with a good guide, then you can, it, 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 as long as you can go, you're pointing in the right direction. He was capable of pedaling all the way across the country. That's so amazing. I'm wondering if the simplicity of just getting up and riding and stopping to eat, and stopping to sleep made living with earlier stage Alzheimer's a little easier. Cause you know, when you've got your home, you know, you've got all the responsibilities of taking care of the home and taking care of yourself and dealing with this disease. There's a lot of moving parts that I think this kind of trip eliminated because all you yep. have to do basically is just like get up, eat, ride, repeat. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, it's it's so interesting when you when you when you get into, I mean, that you know, I listened to another podcast and someone else, and they were saying, you know, seventy five percent of what is uh, what what addresses cardiovascular is also good for Alzheimer's, which is it's sleep, diet, exercise, and you know, we we saw I saw Merv in his house with all these posts trying to organize, and you you saw it was just so taxing. And he would get stacks of news, you know, the regular reader of the newspaper and he'd read, um, you know, the newspaper and it, but suddenly there'd be a pile of 12 newspapers with all these notes and stuff. And he, it just, it, he was, he was just being overloaded, trying to process lots of written stuff. And so I think there's something to be said absolutely about simplifying, getting out of that and nature, exposure mm -hmm. to nature, fresh air, movement. You know, and one one telling um, uh, one telling uh, sign was on our drive down from the D.C. airport down to Yorktown, Virginia. I asked my dad. I was like, "Yeah, so you know, you, you could see he was still kind of in that overloaded uh, from the from being an overloaded paper, yeah. all these life duties." And I said, "What are you feeling right now?" And he said, "You know, I I feel what my uh, his father died of Alzheimer's." Okay. And so that was, so that was my first exposure when I was in high school. Um, you know, I, I had met my, uh, I saw my grandfather when I was in ninth grade and he was out to visit with my grandmother. And it was like, I was talking with a six-year-old, a friendly six-year-old. And that was a, wow. Okay. So when my dad years later said mild cognitive impairment, you know, that, and a number of other things I said, wow, okay. Is this going to happen with my dad as well? Um, and, uh, but, but so when, we're driving down. He says, yeah, I, I, I remember my dad saying it was like he had a vice around his temples and his forehead. And I, I, I feel this. I feel just this fog and this vice all around here. He's pointing up here. Um, okay. That, you know, what else are you feeling? He's like, yeah. And I, and I feel just kind of a tightness in my, in my chest here, this. And um, I was like, okay. Uh, I would ask him every day on the ride, how's your, how's your temple? How's your forehead? Not a problem. How's your chest? Uh, not a problem. And so the you know the two kind of symptoms that he was most expressing frustration with of, of your I mean feeling not not um, neuro not less neurological but feeling he didn't have that when he was on two wheels in fresh air huffing and puffing. <laughs> and in, and in a perfect world, absolutely, I would have, I would like the journey almost wouldn't have stopped it would have just hey we got some now he's going over here and now he's going to the care and now he's meeting some and you know and and because that that is one of the challenges is just 
um, at a certain point, it's, it was hard to um, uh, keep them active. Um, and that, and once you stop the being active, you see a much more marked decline. And this is this is post trip. I believe it. I mean, it's, they sell you sitting and sitting on your buns, even if you've worked out in the morning. Sitting all day is definitely not good for your heart or your brain. And so I always learned that any you know heart health is equal to brain health. So that's a simplified way of stating what you stated a minute ago. Did yeah, you see sitting any is, sitting is the newest uh, is, the, is the sitting is the you know the the cancer of today basically. Yeah. And I've got an Apple Watch and it harasses me regularly. Except when my phone's on do not disturb. I, I learned that. I was like, I've been talking to this person for over an hour. My watch hasn't annoyed me. <laughs> mm. But it will as soon as I un, un, you know, unblock my phone. It'll be like, time to stand. And I take the, that couple minutes to, to do some stretches and move. Just I don't just stand up and wander around. I actually participate in a little bit of something. Yeah. Um, yeah. But since we were talking about the the simplicity being much better for him cognitively. Did you ever notice any maybe like a little bit of reversal of his symptoms or just they just stayed no, pretty much steady? No, you know, I no, uh, no did not. Um, uh, I, I, I should. Um, yeah. I mean, it was, I, I would notice little things, but it was, it, it was mostly, it was the same. Um, so all the things that I mentioned, uh, you know, up to this point and, and what I will say though is, you know, for our, for th this was a tough enough challenge. Take out, take away the Alzheimer's everything that, that um, the first few weeks were going to make or break us. And it was clear. And we, we, on day 10, we were real close to throwing in the towel. Uh, my dad said, you know what, maybe this is too much. Um, and uh, we, we had, we had just spent the night. Uh, we, we didn't make it as far as we wanted. We, we were up in Appalachia there and the temperature was down at like in 20, 20 degrees. And he was, uh, you know, part of the challenge of being 75 is you then, uh, in his case, would get up five times a night to go pee. Mm. And, and so that's one thing when you got, you're in your bed and your bedroom right there uh, and a bathroom right there. It's another thing when it's 20 degrees out and you're in a sleeping bag with a liner inside with a sleeping, uh, uh, you know, a, a tent with a uh, rain tarp and you, and, and he needs to put on his shoes and so, and, and so every out and back, it becomes this 30 minute kind of, uh, Pilates triathlon sort of thing and uh, nocturnal Pilates triathlon. And as a result, every time he comes back, as the purpose of a sleeping bag is to retain the heat. You lose the heat and you start over. So he wakes up shivering. We spend a couple hours, you know, I get the warming him up. And that's when we have this heart to heart of like, you know, is this too much? And um, at which point I gained perspective and said, hold on, we've biked 44 miles per day, 70 miles a second, 60 miles a day. We've done seven days straight of riding, including hills. We're, and this is amazing. And we have, it's not like we prepared for three months. Um, let's take a timeout and let's go in. Um, we're, we'll, we'll do it. We're going to do a short day here. Um, and, and let's take a 20 hour rest and let's see how we feel. Um, and we did that. And then we made a few adjustments going forward. And that was magical. After that, we, we got in a rhythm and, and it was like, okay, actually, I think we may be able to pull this off. But, but when we, it, it was survival for those first five states then when we got to, by the time we got to Idaho, we were in a rhythm. And that's when we started to have some conversations about Alzheimer's, um, specifically Alzheimer's. And, um, and uh, at, at the same time, one of the, you know, I talked about this, that three week period, part of the deal of going on this trip was we needed to, we wanted to make arrangements to list his house for sale, get that prepped before we went. So we got it all cleaned out, ready to go. Well, I get a call when we're in Idaho that says, hey, we've uh, we've got an offer on the house and we've uh, been able to sell the house. Um, and so I share that with my dad while we're writing and uh, he has a reaction that is different than what I was expecting, which again, sometimes we know that there's some unexpected reaction. And he says, "What? What do you? What, what do you mean? So you wanna you wanna uh, uh, put me in a cage and lock me up in a cage and throw away the key? That literally is a verbatim out." Yikes. And I'm like, "Whoa, wait, where, like where did that come from?" And we talked about all this, this, and um, and uh, and uh, 
And and then there was another comment about, you know, when he was talking about, I mentioned stacks of 12 newspapers. And I, along with family member friends said, hey, maybe, you know, maybe just ha have them just get the Saturday and Sunday newspaper. And then he can, because there's plenty to read in that. And uh, and when I shared that, he says, no, oh, you, you, you just want to, I, I studied political science. You just want to erase my, erase me and erase my history and everything. I mean, this very passionate. Uh, and I hadn't had some of those sort of attacking, um, uh, uh, very aggressive responses. This is while we're peddling. Yeah. Uh, and so I realized, okay, wait a minute. I need to, I, I need to rethink kind of to take some time. And so he took, and actually what I said, I said, Hey dad, I said that, you know, the, my biggest concern is not about you in this, in this moving into this next, uh, this independent senior living. My concern is how soon before I get a call that you can't be there. Um, and he said, well, you know, why, 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 why would that ever happen? And I said, well, you know, for example, you might, you, you might, uh, unwittingly go into someone else's room or something like that. No, why would I ever do that? Well, that night when we got into our hotel there in Idaho, we were in the lobby and I'm chatting with another gentleman um, uh, who was biking across country. And we're chatting and my dad comes and he says, uh, oh, hey, you know, can I go to the room? And so I, I give him the key to our second floor room. I was like, sure, you know, go ahead. And I and I'm chatting, but I'm looking out of the corner of my eye, watching him. He does not go up the staircase. He goes halfway down a hall, and you see him trying to get into someone else's room. Um, and he's there for thirty seconds, a minute, and then he comes back to me, and I and he's like, kind of starts to ask a question about the game. I say, "Hey, Dad, yeah, let's let, let's go on upstairs." Um, you know, so that that was. Um, yeah, so it was me seeing some of that for the first time, um, and recognizing, uh, that, okay, you know, we got some challenges and, um, and, and one of the things that I had, had, uh, that I think is a great resource for, for, you know, your listeners, um, a friend had suggested that I uh, read a uh, tool one days, uh, uh, on being mortal or being mortal, what really talks about the last third of life in the U S and other places. Um, and so I listened to that, that next couple days, less talk. And I actually listened to the audio book while we were cycling <laughs> and there's towards the back, there's these magic questions, he called them. And, um, I then, you know, three days after this really rough interaction with my dad, I said, uh, I, I use those. And so it was, uh, the first question was, you know, Hey dad, you know, what's your understanding of your health right now. And I shut my mouth and I let him talk. And that was for, you know, 10 minutes talking again. We're again, we're pedaling here through Eastern Oregon now. Um, and, uh, and I just listen, maybe ask a simple little, like, you know, tell me more or something. And, uh, uh, and then the second was, you know, well, you know, what, are, what are your, what are your concerns? And, um, and he tells me some and, uh, uh, another 15 minutes and, you know, you know, what are your hopes tells me 15 minutes. And, and then the last was, what would a good day, you know, what would a great day look like for you? And again, I close my mouth and talks at the end of those 45 minutes to an hour. Um, you know, again, occasionally we're side by side, occasionally getting uh, one, one in front of the other if traffic's coming or something, but it was actually pretty quiet um, with just that, whirling of the, the, the four wheels going and, uh, and a little light wind. Uh, he, he, my dad says, uh, Kari, you know, that's one of the best conversations we've ever had. Mm, that's a nice memory. Yeah. Yeah. And so, so, you know, that I, I, so I, and I wished I'd listened to that audiobook sooner, um, <laughs> to take that same approach. I think just having the conversation, what, what, what's a good day look like for you? understanding that as their disease progresses would be really, really helpful because my goal with my mom who lived in memory care the last three years of her life after my dad passed away was to give her as much joy as possible and as much quality of life as possible without extending dying from Alzheimer's, which, you know, we never know what that looks like. So that was, that was a big challenge. 
and it was it was very hard not to put my expectations of what she should have been able to do. She should have been traveling and hanging out with the grandkids and doing the crap she wanted yeah. to do. But yeah. maybe because when she was in memory care, she had friends that basically she got into mischief and mayhem with nothing serious, just just funny little stories that I'm now writing down. And, you know, just sitting around in the courtyard with the sun, you know, close by the the, the edges were covered. So, you, you know, it kind of had reflective sunlight, just shooting the breeze with two other Dianes. That was my mom's name was Diane. So, you know, having her dog talking to friends, that was a good day for her. Yeah. So that I think that's that's a really good takeaway from your your trip is just ask your loved ones. It doesn't matter if they've got Alzheimer's. Ask them now, like, what's a really good day look like for you? Because mm -hmm. then you might know what their expectations are. And if you got to make some adjustments as a household, well, then you can do that. I would love <laughs> yeah. to go ahead. <laughs> but I was going to say, you used the word joy um, when you started talking there. And I I'm sure you, you, you probably read or familiar with the Moments of Joy um, by mm -hmm. Joy Brackey. And so really? I had I had read that um, prior and I thought that was just such an important uh, perspective and kind of mindset for approaching this where so all along the trip, it would for me, it was about finding moments of joy and joy is so often expressed for me. The currency is smiles. Is my dad smiling? And if he's smiling, it doesn't, it doesn't matter where we are, what, you know, what the expectation It's just that's a pretty awesome thing when someone is smiling 